Section 14, Book the 14th of the Iliad of Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stephen Carney. The Iliad of Homer by Homer, translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. Section 14, Book the 14th. Argument. Agamemnon and the other wounded chiefs visit the battle with Nestor. Juno, having borrowed the cestus of Venus, first obtains the assistance of sleep, and then hastens to Ida to inveigle Jove. She prevails, Jove sleeps, and Neptune seizes the opportunity to aid the Trojans. But the shouting did not entirely escape the notice of Nestor, although drinking, but he addressed winged words to the son of Aesculapius. Consider, noble Machaon, how well these things will be. Greater certainly grows the shouting of the blooming youths at the ships, but sitting here at present drink indeed the dark wine until fair-haired hecamede has warmed the tepid baths and washed away the bloody gore whilst i going with speed to a watch-tower will gain information so saying he took the well-made shield of his own son horse-breaking thrasymedes which was lying in the tent all shining with brass for he had the shield of his sire and seized a strong spear pointed with sharp brass and stood without the tent and soon beheld an unseemly deed these the greeks in confusion and those the haughty trojans routing them in the rear but the wall of the greeks had fallen and as when the vast deep blackens with a noiseless wave foreboding with no effect the rapid courses of the shrill blasts nor yet is it rolled forwards or backwards before some decisive blast comes down from jove so meditated the old man distracted in his mind between two opinions whether he should go amongst a throng of fleet-horsed greeks or to Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, shepherd of the people. But to him thus reflecting, it appeared better to go in quest of the son of Atreus. Meanwhile they kept slaughtering each other, contending, and the solid brass around their bodies rang, as they were stricken with the swords and two-edged spears. But the Jove-cherished kings, coming up from the vessels of Metnestor, as many as had been wounded with the brass, Tydides and Ulysses and Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, their ships indeed were drawn up upon the shore of the hoary deep very far away from the battle for they had drawn the first as far as the plain and had built a wall at their sterns for broad as it was the shore was by no means able to contain their vessels and the people were crowded wherefore they drew them up in rows one behind the other and filled the wide mouth of the whole shore as much as the promontories enclosed there then were they walking together leaning upon the spear in order to behold the tumult and the battle and the heart in their bosoms was grieved but aged nestor met them and terrified the souls in the breasts of the greeks whom first king agamemnon addressing said o nelaean nestor great glory of the greeks why leaving the man-destroying battle comest thou hither truly i fear lest impetuous hector make good his speech as once he threatened haranguing among the trojans that he would not return to ilium from the ships before that he had burned the ships with fire and slain us also thus indeed he harangued and now are all things fulfilling ye gods surely the other well-grieved greeks as well as achilles store up wrath against me in their minds nor are they willing to fight at the sterns of the ships but him the gerenian knight nestor then answered assuredly these things are in active accomplishment nor could even lofty thundering jove himself contrive them otherwise for the wall in which we trusted that it would be an impregnable defence to the ships and to ourselves has now fallen but they are sustaining an obstinate contest at the swift ships nor couldst thou any longer distinguish though examining particularly on which side the greeks confounded or routed so promiscuously are they slain whilst the shout reaches heaven let us however deliberate how these things will be if counsel avail anything although i advise not that we enter the battle for it is by no means proper that a wounded man should fight but him then answered agamemnon king of men nestor since they are combating at the sterns of the ships and the constructed rampart avails not nor the ditch at which the greeks suffered much and hoped in their minds that it would be an impregnable defence to the ships and to themselves surely it will be agreeable to all-powerful jove that the greeks perish there inglorious far away from argus for i was conscious when he unwillingly gave assistance to the greeks and i know now that he honours those the trojans equally with the happy gods but hath fettered our courage and our hands but come let us all obey as i shall advise let us draw down the ships as many as are drawn up first near the sea and launch them all into the vast ocean 
let us moor them at the anchor in the deep till mortal deceiving night arrive if even then the trojans may abstain from battle and then we may perhaps draw down all the vessels for there is no disgrace in flying from evil not even during the night it is better for a flying man to escape from evil than to be taken but him sternly regarding wise ulysses then addressed son of atreus what speech hath escaped thy lips lost man thou shouldst command some worthless army and not rule over us to whom jove hath granted from youth even unto old age to accomplish toilsome wars until we each of us shall perish dost thou then desire thus to leave wide wayed troy on account of which we have endured so many woes be silent lest some other of the greeks hear a speech which a man ought not to have brought through his mouth whosoever understands in his mind how to speak prudent things who is a sceptre-bearer and whom so many people obey as many as thou dost govern among the greeks for now do i reprobate thy judgment in what thou hast said who commandest us whilst the war and battle are waged to draw down the well-benched ships to the sea in order that the wishes of the trojans may be still better fulfilled victorious though they be and dire destruction fall upon us for the greeks will not maintain the fight whilst the ships are being dragged to the sea but will look back and retire from the combat then will thy counsel be injurious o leader of the people but him agamemnon the king of men then answered much o ulysses hast thou touched me to the soul with thy severe reproof yet i commanded not the sons of the greeks against their will to draw the well-benched ships down to the sea but now would that there were one either young or old who would deliver an opinion better than this it would be to my joy but among them diomede valiant in the din of battle also spoke the man is near we need not seek far if indeed ye are willing to be persuaded and do not find fault each through wrath because i am by birth the youngest among you for i boast that my race is from a noble sire tydeus whom the heaped-up earth covers at thebes for to portheus were born three distinguished sons and they dwelt in pleuron and lofty caledon agrius and melus but the third was the knight oeneus the father of my father who was conspicuous among them for valour he indeed remained there but my father as an exile dwelt at argus for so jove willed and the other gods but he married one of the daughters of adrastus and he and and he inhabited a mansion opulent in resources and corn-bearing fields were his in abundance and there were many rows of plants around him numerous were his herds and he surpassed the greeks in the use of the spear but these things he ought to know since it is a truth do not therefore dispute the opinion freely delivered which i give advisedly deeming that i am base by birth and unwarlike come then let us go to battle wounded as we are from necessity there then let us ourselves approach the combat out of the reach of weapons lest any one receive wound upon wound and encouraging others we will urge them on who hitherto gratifying their souls have stood apart nor fought thus he spoke and to him they all listened readily and obeyed wherefore they hastened to advance and the king of men agamemnon led them nor did the illustrious earth-shaker keep a negligent lookout but he went amongst them like unto an aged man and he caught the right hand of agamemnon the son of atreus and addressing him spoke winged words son of atreus now perchance the revengeful heart of achilles rejoices in his breast beholding the slaughter and rout of the greeks since there is no feeling in him not even a little may he however thus perish and may a god cover him with disgrace but with thee the blessed gods are not yet altogether enraged but again the leaders and chiefs of the trojans will perchance raise the dust upon the wide plain and thou wilt behold them flying towards the city from the ships and the tents so saying he shouted aloud rushing over the plain as loud as nine or ten thousand men shout beginning the contest of mars so loud a cry did king neptune send forth from his breast and he cast great resolution into every heart among the greeks to war and to fight incessantly but golden throned juno standing looked down with her eyes from the summit of olympus and immediately recognized her own brother who was also her brother-in-law exerting himself through the glorious battle and she rejoiced in her mind she also beheld jove sitting upon the highest top of many rilled ida and he was hateful to her soul then the venerable large-eyed juno next anxiously considered how she could beguile the mind of age-sparing jove and now this plan appeared best to her mind to proceed to ida having well arrayed herself if perchance he might desire us to lie beside her form in dalliance so that she might pour upon his eyelids and vigilant mind careless and genial sleep 
and she proceeded to her chamber which vulcan her dear son had made for her and had fitted the thick doors to the lintels with a secret bolt and this no other god could remove there entering in she closed the shining doors first she washed all impurities from her lovely person and anointed herself with rich oil ambrosial and agreeable which was odoriferous to her and the perfume of which when shaken in the brazen floored mansion of jove reached even to earth and to heaven with this having anointed her body and having also combed her hair with her hands she arranged her shining locks beautiful ambrosial which flowed from her immortal head next she threw around her an ambrosial robe which minerva had wrought for her in needlework and had embroidered much varied work upon it and she fastened it upon her breast with golden clasps then she girded herself with a zone adorned with a hundred fringes and in her well perforated ears placed her triple gemmed elaborate earrings and much grace shone from her from above she divine of goddesses covered herself with a veil beautiful newly wrought and it was bright as the sun and beneath her shining feet she fastened her beautiful sandals but when she had arranged all her ornaments around her person she proceeded straight from her chamber and having called venus apart from the other gods addressed her in speech wilt thou now be at all obedience to me dear child in what i shall say or wilt thou refuse enraged in thy mind on this account because i aid the greeks whilst thou aidest the trojans but her venus the daughter of jove then answered juno venerable goddess daughter of mighty saturn declare whatsoever thou dost meditate for my mind urges me to accomplish it if indeed i can accomplish it and if it be practicable but her the venerable juno meditating guile addressed give now to me that loveliness and desire with which thou dost subdue all immortals and mortal men for i go to visit the limits of the fertile earth and oceanus the parent of the gods and mother tethys who receiving me from rhea nurtured and educated me with care in their abodes when far resounding jove cast down saturn beneath the earth and the fruitless sea these i go to visit and i will put an end to eternal quarrels for already have they abstained for a length of time from the couch and embrace of each other since anger fell upon their mind but if by persuading their hearts by my words i should lead them back to the bed to be united in love then should i always be called by them beloved and revered but her laughter-loving venus in turn addressed it is not possible nor becoming to refuse thy request for thou reclinest in the arms of mightiest jove take this now place in thy bosom this variegated belt in which all things are contained and i think that thou wilt not return with thy object unaccomplished whatsoever thou desirest in thy mind thus she spake and the large-eyed venerable juno smiled and smiling then placed it in her bosom but venus the daughter of jove departed to the palace and juno hastening quitted the summit of olympus and having passed over pieria and fertile emathia she hastened over the snowy mountains of the equestrian thrace most lofty summits nor did she touch the ground with her feet from athos she descended to the foaming deep and came to lemnus the city of divine thoas where she met sleep the brother of death to whose hand she then clung and spoke and addressed him o sleep king of all gods and all men if ever indeed thou didst listen to my entreaty now too be persuaded and i will acknowledge gratitude to thee all my days close immediately in sleep for me the bright eyes of jove under his eyelids after i couch with him in love and i will give thee as gifts a handsome golden throne forever incorruptible and my limping son vulcan adorning it shall make it and below thy feet he shall place a footstool upon which thou mayest rest thy shining feet while feasting but her sweet sleep answering addressed juno venerable goddess daughter of great saturn any other of the everlasting gods could i easily lull to sleep and even the flowing of rapid ocean who is the parent of all but i could not approach saturnian jove nor lull him to sleep unless at least he himself command me for once already at least has he terrified me by his threats on that day when the magnanimous son of jove hercules sailed from ilium having sacked the city of the trojans then i lulled the mind of aegis-bearing jove being poured gently around him whilst thou wast planning evils in thy mind against the hero rousing the blasts of bitter winds over the deep and thou didst afterwards carry him away apart from all his friends to well-inhabited coasts but he when awakened was enraged hurling about the gods through his mansion and me chiefly of all he sought and would have cast me down a lost one from the ether into the deep had not night vanquisher of gods and men preserved me to whom i came flying 
So he restrained himself, angry as he was, for he dreaded lest he should do things which were disagreeable to swift night. And now again dost thou urge me to perform this another dangerous deed. But him the venerable large-eyed Juno in turn answered, O sleep! Why thinkest thou these things within thy mind? Canst thou suppose that far-sounding Jove favours the Trojans, as he was enraged on account of Hercules, his own son? But come, do this, and I will give thee one of the younger graces to wed, and to be called thy spouse, Pisithia, whom thou fondly desirest day after day. Thus she spoke, but sleep was delighted, and answering addressed her, Come now, swear to me by the inviolable water of the Styx, and touch with one hand the fertile earth, and with the other the marble sea, so that all the gods beneath around Saturn may be witnesses between us, that thou wilt surely give me one of the younger graces, Pasithia, whom I will desire all my days. Thus he spoke, nor did the white-armed goddess Juno disobey, but she swore as he desired, and named all gods who dwell under Tartarus, which are called Titans. When then she had sworn and performed her oath, they both proceeded, leaving the city of Lemnus and Imbrus, mantled in haze, quickly making their way. And they came to Ida of many rills, the mother of wild beasts, to Lectus, where first they quitted the sea. But they both advanced over the land, and the summit of the wood was shaken beneath their feet. Their sleep on his part remained, before the eyes of Jove should perceive him, ascending a lofty fir, which then growing the highest upon Ida, sprung up through the air to the clouds. There he sat, thickly covered with the fir branches, like unto a shrill bird, which living in the mountains the gods call Chalcis, and men Simindus. But Juno proceeded hastily to Gargarus, the summit of lofty Ida, and cloud-compelling Jove beheld her. But the instant he beheld her, that instant desire entirely shadowed around his august mind, just as when they first were united in love, retiring to the bed without the knowledge of their dear parents. And he stood before her and spoke, and addressed her, Wherefore, hastening from Olympus, Juno, comest thou hither? but thy horses and chariot are not near, which thou mayest ascend. But him the venerable Juno, meditating guiles, addressed, I go to visit the limits of the fertile earth, and Oceanus, the parent of the gods, and mother Tethys, who nurtured and trained me with care in their palaces. Them I go to see, and will take away their bitter quarrels, for already they abstain a long while from the couch, and embrace of each other, since anger has invaded their minds. But my steeds, which will bear me over dry and wet, stand near the base of Ida with many rills. Now, however, on thy account have I come hither from Olympus, lest perchance thou shouldst afterwards be angry with me, were I to depart in secret to the abode of deep-flowing Oceanus. But her cloud-collecting Jove answering addressed, Juno, thither thou canst go even by and by but come now let us reclining be delighted with love for never at any time did the love of a goddess or a woman poured around the heart within thy breast so subdue me neither when i loved the wife of ixion who bore pirithus a counsellor equal to the gods nor when i loved fair-ankled denia the daughter of Acrisius, who bore Perseus, the most illustrious of all men, nor when with that of the celebrated daughter of Phoenix, who bore me to Minos, and godlike Rhadamanthus, nor yet when I loved Semele, nor Alcamena in Thebes, who brought forth my valiant son Hercules, but Semele bore me Bacchus, a joy to mortals, nor when I loved Ceres, the fair-haired queen, nor when glorious Latona, nor thyself, as I now love thee, and sweet desire seizes me. But him, venerable Juno, meditating guiles, addressed, Most shameless son of Saturn, what word hast thou spoken? If now thou desire to recline in love upon the summit of Ida, where all places are exposed, how will it be if any of the immortal gods should perceive us sleeping, and going amongst all the gods disclose it? I, for my part, could never return to thy mansion, arising from the couch for surely it would be unbecoming. But if in truth thou desirest it, and it be agreeable to thy soul, there is a chamber of thine which Vulcan, thy beloved son, formed for thee, and fitted its secure doors to its lintels. Thither let us repair, about to recline, since an embrace is indeed thy desire. But her cloud-collecting Jove answering addressed, Fear not, O Juno, that any of either gods or men shall behold this. Such a golden cloud will I spread around, that not even the sun may see us through it, although his eye is very keen to behold. Thus he spake, and the son of Saturn encircled his wife in his arms, 
and the divine earth produced fresh herbage under them the dewy lotus and the crocus and the hyacinth close and soft which elevated them from the earth upon this couch they reclined and clothed themselves above with a beautiful cloud and lucid dewdrops fell from it thus quietly slumbered the sire upon the summit of gargarus subdued by sleep and love and held his spouse in his arms but sweet sleep hastened to run to the ships of the greeks that he might deliver a message to neptune the shaker of the earth and standing near he addressed to him winged words now neptune heartily give aid to the greeks and bestow glory upon them at least for a little while whilst yet jove sleeps since i have enveloped him in a veil of soft slumber and juno hath deceived him that he might sleep in love so saying he indeed departed to the illustrious tribes of men but he still more impelled neptune to assist the greeks and immediately springing forward far into the van he exhorted them o greeks yet again do we yield the victory to hector the son of priam that he may seize the ships and bear away glory for so indeed he supposes and boasts because achilles remains at the hollow ships enraged at heart however there would not be a great need of him if the rest of us were incited to assist one another but come let us all obey as i shall advise let us clad with shields as many as are best and greatest in the army who are covered as to our heads with glittering helmets and hold the longest spears in our hands advance and i will lead the way nor do i think that hector the son of priam will await us though very eager whatsoever man also is obstinate in the fight and bears but a small shield upon his shoulder let him give it to an inferior man and let him clothe himself in a larger shield thus he spoke but they listened to him readily and obeyed the kings themselves tydides ulysses and agamemnon son of atreus marshalled the troops wounded as they were and going about them all exchanged their martial arms the brave soldier put on the good armour and the worst they gave to the inferior man but when they had girded the splendid brass around their bodies they began to advance and earth-shaking neptune led them on grasping in his firm hand a dreadful tapering sword like unto a thunderbolt with which sword it is not possible to engage in destructive battle for the fear of it restrains men on the other side again illustrious hector drew up the trojans then truly azure-haired neptune and illustrious hector drew forth the severest struggle of war the one indeed aiding the trojans and the other the greeks but the sea was dashed up to the tents and ships of the greeks and they engaged with a mighty shout not so loudly does the billow of the ocean roar against the main land when driven from the deep by the rough blast of boreas nor so great is the crackling of blazing fire in the glens of a mountain when it is raised aloft to consume the wood nor so loud howls the wind amidst the high foliaged oaks which in particular loudly roars in its wrath as was the cry of the trojans and greeks shouting dreadfully when they rushed one upon the other at ajax illustrious hector first took aim with his spear as he was turned right against him nor did he miss he struck him where the two belts were crossed upon his breast both that of the shield and that of the silver-studded sword for these protected the tender skin but hector was enraged because his swift weapon had fled from his hand in vain and he retired back into the crowd of his companions shunning death at him then retiring mighty telamonian ajax threw with a stone for stones in great numbers were rolled about among the feet of the combatants props for the fleet barks lifting up one of these he struck him on the breast above the orb of the shield near the neck and throwing he twirled it like a top and the stone rolled round on all sides as when beneath a violent stroke from father jove an oak falls uprooted and a terrible smell of sulphur arises from it but confidence no longer possesses the man whosoever being near beholds it because the thunderbolt of mighty jove is terrible so rapidly upon the ground fell the might of hector in the dust and he dropped his spear from his hand his shield and helmet followed above him and his armour variegated with brass rang upon him then the sons of the greeks loudly shouting rushed in hoping to draw him off and they hurled numerous javelins but no one was able either to strike from a distance or to smite close at hand the shepherd of the people for the bravest of the warriors polydamus aeneas and noble agenor sarpedon leader of lycians and illustrious glaucus first threw themselves round him and no one of the rest neglected him but they held their well-orbed shields before him but his companions upraising him in their hands bore him out of the conflict till they reached his fleet horses which stood for him in rear of the combat and the war holding both the charioteer and the variegated car which then carried him towards the city groaning heavily 
But when now they came to the ford of the rapid flowing current of eddying Xanthus, whom immortal Jove begat, where they removed him from his car to the ground, and poured water over him, but he breathed again, and looked up with his eyes, and sitting upon his knees disgorged black blood. Again he fell back upon the ground, and dark night overshadowed his eyes, for the blow still subdued his spirits. But when the Greeks saw Hector going apart, they pressed the more on the Trojans, and were mindful of contest. Then swift Oilean Ajax before others, leaping forward with his fir-tree spear, wounded Satnius, son of Enops, whom a naiad, the fairest nymph, bore to Enops, when keeping his flocks by the bank of Satnio. Him the spear-renowned son of Oileus, drawing near, wounded in the flank, but he fell supine, and round him the Trojans and Greeks engaged in a valiant battle. But to him spear-brandishing Polydamus, son of Panthus, came as an avenger, and smote Prothoenor, son of Arilochus, upon the right shoulder. The tough spear passed on through his shoulder, but falling in the dust, he grasped the earth with his hand. And Polydamus boasted mightily over him, shouting aloud, I do not think, indeed, that the weapon hath fled vainly from the sturdy hand of the magnanimous son of Panthus, but some one of the Greeks has received it in his body, and I think that he, leaning upon it, will descend to the mansion of Pluto. Thus he spoke, but grief arose among the Greeks at his boasting, and particularly agitated the mind of warlike Ajax, the son of Telamon, for he had fallen very near him, and he immediately hurled with his shining spear at him departing. Polydamus himself indeed avoided black fate, springing off obliquely, but Archilochus, son of Antenor, received the blow, for to him the gods had doomed destruction. Him then he struck upon the last vertebra, in the joining of the head and neck, and he disjoined both tendons, but the head, the mouth, and the nostrils of him falling, met the ground much sooner than his legs and knees. Then Ajax in turn cried out to blameless Polydamus, Reflect, O Polydamus, and tell me the truth. Is not this man worthy to be slain in exchange of Prothoenor? He appears not to me indeed a coward, nor sprung from cowards, but to be the brother or the son of horse-breaking Antenor, for he seems most like him as to his race. Thus he spoke, well knowing him, but grief possessed the minds of the Trojans. Then Acamas, stalking round his brother, wounded with his spear Promachus, the Boetian, whilst he was dragging him off by the feet. But over him Acamas greatly boasted, calling aloud, Ye Argive archers, insatiable in threats, assuredly not to us alone will toil and sorrow accrue, but thus thou wilt at some time be slain. Consider how your Promachus sleeps, subdued by my spear, that a requital for my brother might not be long unpaid. Therefore should a man wish a brother to be left in his family as an avenger of his death. Thus he spoke, but grief arose among the Greeks as he boasted and he particularly agitated the mind of warlike Peneleus. Accordingly he rushed upon Acamas, who awaited not the charge of King Peneleus, but he wounded Ilioneus, son of Phorbus, rich in flocks, whom Mercury loved most of all the Trojans, and had presented with possessions, and to whom his mother bore Ilioneus alone. Him then he wounded below the brow, in the socket of the eye, and he forced out the pupil, but the spear went forward through the eye and through the back of the head, and he sat down, stretching out both his hands. But Peneleus, drawing his sharp sword, smote him upon the middle of the neck, and lopped off his head with his helmet to the ground, and the strong spear still remained in his eye. But Peneleus, holding it up like a poppy, shouted to the Trojans, and boasting spoke thus, Tell for me, ye Trojans, the beloved father and mother of illustrious Ilioneus, that they may lament him in their halls, for neither shall the wife of Promachus, the son of Eleginor, present herself with joy to her dear husband coming back, when we, sons of the Greeks, return from Troy with our ships. Thus he spoke, but pale fear seized upon them all, and each gazed about, seeking where he might escape utter destruction. Tell me now, ye muses, possessing Olympian dwellings, which of the Greeks now first bore away gore-stained spoils of men, when the illustrious earth-shaker turned the tide of battle? Telamonian Ajax then first wounded Hertius, son of Gertius, leader of the undaunted Mycenaeans, and Antilochus spoiled Phalces and Murmurus. Meriones slew Morus and Hippotion, and Teucer slew Prothus and Periphoetius. But the son of Atreus next wounded upon the flank Hyperenor, the shepherd of the people, and the spear cutting its way drank his entrails, and his soul expelled, fled in haste through the inflicted wound, and darkness veiled his eyes. 
But Ajax, the swift son of Oileus, slew the most, because there was not one equal to him on foot to follow the flying men when Jove had excited flight amongst them. End of Book the Fourteenth Read by Stephen Carney